Hello, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman, and each show I bring to you an interesting and provocative scholar to discuss topics in social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you enjoy what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. Welcome, everybody, to Ideas Having Sex. I am Chris Kaufman, and today I am joined by Lauren Hall. Lauren is a professor of political science at the Rochester Institute of Technology and the author of The Medicalization of Birth and Death, which we are discussing today. Thank you for joining me, Lauren. It's great to be here. Thanks. So your kind of hook for your book, and I think this is the the blurb, is that maybe 100 years ago, the vast majority of people gave birth and died in the home, but today the vast majority of people give birth and die in a hospital. So can I, I was wondering if I could give you like maybe a snapshot of, I think what a a popular objection to some of the thrust of your book is. And you tell me maybe like what's wrong with that or where you would contradict it in your book. Absolutely. I think this is what a lot of people would say or someone's gut reaction before they actually read your book, which addresses plenty of these criticisms. But obviously people used to give birth more in the home and die more in the home. Um, And obviously that's changed because technology has improved and medical care is better and safer. And it's a wonderful thing that more women don't have to die in childbirth. You know, it used to be such a dangerous thing. You go in a war, the risks of dying and and death obviously is also very dangerous. People die during death, for God's sakes. And both are inherently medical activities anyway. So what's what's the problem with medicalizing them or or having them done in hospitals centralized with all the best medical technology? And why do you want women to die? (laughs) Great opening. Yeah, so obviously uh, I've given birth three times. I gave birth in hospitals all three times. I have absolutely nothing against hospitals. Um, The problem actually, it becomes an issue when you look at it sort of in the aggregate. So um, it's it's not the case that um, I guess I guess part of what I'm trying to argue in the book is that uh, is it it's not the case that medicalization has led to universally positive outcomes. And in fact, what we see when we look at both birth and death, and there's reasons for this, um, is that we actually overtreat people. People get far too much medical treatment. They get far too much intense medical treatment. Um, we really prioritize procedures over personal care. And that sounds a little like sort of woo woo or whatever, but but actually the research demonstrates that really what people need during birth and, and at the end of life is sort of hands on um, what, what we call um, high touch as opposed to high tech care. And so we actually can see in the data that the outcomes are are in some ways worse. So while it's true that um, birth at home at the turn of the century was not uh, super safe. Um, birth in hospitals actually carries with it a variety of serious uh, health risks as well. Um, and while it's, of course, not the case that, um, uh, you know, many, many people would have benefited from hospitalization in the early part of the 20th century, for example, um, a lot of those people could have recovered if they'd had antibiotics or something like that. So the the population I'm really looking at in the book are people at the end of life for whom medicine doesn't actually offer that much. Um, so if you look at, for example, the statistics on cancer patients um, or people with uh, advanced dementia, um, we tend to hospitalize those people and do a lot of procedures on those people. And those procedures do very, very little to benefit those people and actually contribute a fairly serious amount of harm. So on both ends of the spectrum, I think we we have some serious issues in terms of overtreatment. But the other piece of this, and, and your your comment um, when you sort of uh, um, did your nice setting up here um, about them being inherently medical, uh, there you'd get a lot of pushback from people in the birth community. Um, the vast majority of births do not require any kind of medical intervention. So there's a question, I think, there about whether it is, in fact, a medical issue inherently does birth entail medical risks of course and very in in many situations it does um but the us is an outlier in the fact in the sense that um women in the united states give birth primarily with trained surgeons whereas in the rest of the world women tend to um give birth in a sort of triage system where they start with midwives and then work their way up to surgeons if they need surgery. So there's a whole host of things that we can dig into, but that's sort of my just off the cuff response. And then I'm sure we'll we'll dig into some more um, sort of really fun possible objections as well. 
Yeah, you mentioned a few a few terms in there that I I wanted you to maybe dis disentangle because I think it's it's yeah. easy to get them confused. The phrase medicalization that's in the title of your book. You also focus a lot on hospitals, and I guess can you disentangle and and talk about the overlap and differences between the terms medicalization, hospitalization, and overtreatment? Because they're not the same, but there's plenty of overlap there. No, that's a great question. So medicalization is just the process. It's 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 sometimes used in a negative way, but like it sometimes has a sort of normative cast to it. But in its most simple form, it's it's a neutral term that simply describes the process by which something becomes sort of or comes under the lens of uh, the medical establishment. So the the way in which something becomes either a disease or an illness or sometimes does not. Um, so some people, for example, would argue that the medicalization of alcoholism um, or alcohol abuse disorder was a positive thing, right? Back in the day, if you were an alcoholic, that was seen as a character flaw, right? You're just a bad person, right? You drink too much. And once alcoholism became medicalized, there was the move to recognize the fact that this is somewhat out of people's control. It's going to require some medical intervention. People are going to need assistance from the medical community to, uh, to overcome it. And so that was viewed positively, right? That kind of medicalization. On the flip side, um, for a long time, homosexuality was viewed as a, um, it started out as sort of a character flaw and then became a medical issue. It became actually a mental illness. So it was in one of the DSM, I don't know which volume it was, but it was considered a psychiatric illness. So when homosexuality was demedicalized, people saw that as a, as a sort of triumph for the dignity of, um, of gay men and women. So it, medicalization itself isn't really good or bad. It, it just describes this process by which society determines what's an illness, what's not, what are we going to call sort of a character flaw? What are we going to call just part of someone's identity? And how do we make those decisions? So that's sort of the process of, of medicalization. And it's it's a cultural phenomenon, it's a social phenomenon, but it also happens to have pretty important political inputs, which we'll probably talk about later. And that's really the focus of my book. I'm not a sociologist, I'm a political scientist. So my my interest is always in sort of the political inputs into these um, into these processes. So that's medicalization. Um, hospitalization, when I talk about hospitalization in the context of the book, I'm really looking at when people are admitted to acute care facilities. So as opposed to outpatient facilities or like community clinics, I'm really looking at people who are admitted to um, uh, inpatient acute care facilities where you have a lot of really qualified trained staff. Um, and the it turns out that having a lot of really qualified trained staff around can be a blessing or a curse, depending on what specific issue you have, uh, because a lot of people with a lot of training very often want to use that training. And so that's part of the process of medicalization that I talk about. And then the final thing is overtreatment. And this is a little bit more complicated because overtreatment clearly is normative, right? Like overtreatment, the implication is that you're getting too much treatment. It it's implies bad. like a correct amount of treatment. Exactly. And it's hard to know. I mean, even, um, you know, I, I was waiting around in the maternity care literature for five years, sort of working on this book. And it's really people disagree on like what the what the best, for example, proportion of cesarean section births is. Um, so in the United States, a, a little over 30 percent of women give birth via cesarean section. Most people think that's far too high. But if you ask people to actually identify what like the ideal number of cesarean sections is, it'll range anywhere from like 10 to 20 percent. 10 is a is a pretty low number. You will not get a lot of people in the medical establishment agreeing with 10 percent. 20 most people would agree that that's a, a pretty decent number. And of course, the real concern for cesareans is you want to avoid the first you want to avoid first time moms getting a cesarean, because those are the folks who then their chances of needing a cesarean in, in second and third pregnancies increases really dramatically. It's much, much harder to give birth um, vaginally. And that comes with its own set of risks. So, so again, when, when I think, it, you know, one of the really interesting things from the literature that I found is that the medical community can, can often recognize overtreatment when they see it, but that recognition is often reactive. So people will look back at a cancer patient and say, that was way too much chemo. But it's really, really hard. Or or they'll say in the aggregate, cancer patients are getting That's too much chemo. That's what I was going to say. Like, it seems easy to say, when you look at all of the numbers, it's over treatment. But in any, in you know, when you take the big picture view, it's an easy call. Yeah. But when you take your small picture view as one doctor or one patient wanting to avoid what you think is a big risk, more treatment, more treatment. 
And that becomes the the big problem. And I talked to a lot of different, so I, I did a ton of interviews with practitioners and physicians for the book. Um, and a lot of them pointed to that problem of the the pressures of actually practicing with, uh, you know, when, when you're, when you are responsible for this family's sort of uh, comfort, their sense of hope, their sense of optimism. Um, but it is interesting that there's really clear differences between types of doctors. So the palliative care physicians that I interviewed um, were much better able or this is probably, I mean, that's sort of a biased way of putting it, but we're more likely to say this particular case, we are, we are over-treating. We're providing, this guy should not be getting chemo. He should be home with his family. Whereas the oncologists were much less likely to make that call. And the same thing is true for midwives versus obstetricians. So you see real differences in specialization um, in people's desire to identify over-treatment, even in specific individual cases. So I don't know how much this, how much it's been verified uh, in any systematic way, but long time ago, uh, the blogger Scott Alexander turned me on to an article called How Doctors Die. I don't know if you've if you've read that written by a doctor named Ken Murray. And like the tagline is I pulled it up. The tagline is what's unusual about medical professionals is not how much treatment they get when they're faced with a terminal illness, but how little. And it pretty much goes on to to explain on the receiving end, medical professionals really do not want to be spending a lot of time with heavy amounts of treatment in a hospital when they are terminal. Um, and they know that system very well, and there's a good reason and that they don't want to do that. But when they're on the other side of that, you talk about this a little bit in the book, but this isn't fully the picture that you paint. The doctors want to put it on like, I don't necessarily want to give all this extra treatment. But the families of dying people, this wasn't about birth so much, the families of dying people insist. So there's like an individual, you know, risk aversion or or desire to seem like a good son or daughter or something to your dying parent. Uh, you, your book really is more heavy on um, looking at regulatory and funding policy causes that have kind of funneled us into this, this type of treatment. So can you say something about how the incentives have been shaped by policy to over medicalize and over, you know, an emphasis on number of procedures, for instance, as opposed to outcome, which isn't like typical, I think, in most industries. Yeah, I, I trace back. And and by the way, there's a wonderful book by Paul by the sociologist Paul Starr called The Social Transformation of American Medicine. And it won tons of prizes. It's really amazing. He does a beautiful job of tracing sort of the history of the U.S. healthcare system, as well as how it differs from from others. It's not a comparative work. It's a historical work. But he's really done a beautiful job of sort of watch looking at how this landscape changed. I'll include that Um, in the show notes. Yeah, please do. It's, It's a great book. Uh, I, you know, when I'm looking at sort of the policy landscape and the, the metaphor that I use in the book is, is the watershed, the, the broader water policy watershed and sort of how it affects how people get funneled into certain kinds of treatments. And there's a couple really important landscape pieces on that watershed in the United States, at least. Uh, one of the first was the uh, Flexner Report of 1910. So that was one of the first um, attempts to standardize medical practice in the United States. So prior to 1910, we had just this sort of like really diverse landscape for both good and bad. Like there were lots of medical colleges. Some were barely apprenticeship programs. Others were Johns Hopkins. So there was a real diversity and quality. Um, And so the Flexner Report was really trying to standardize medical care and standardize the quality of, of medical training in particular. And one of the reasons for this, so there were sort of Throughout this story, there's there's always sort of two motivations that operate in tandem. There's a deep concern, obviously, for patient safety. That's one of the major things that comes out of the Flexner Report. But the other concern is, hey, we can't get rid of all of these other providers like midwives and other, you know, these quacks unless we have our house in order. So there's very much this kind of feeling that we need to standardize medical education in order to take our proper place as the primary healthcare providers in the United States landscape. So that's kind of the first big, um, the first big push. And then you get the Hill Burton Act of 1948. Um, And the Hill Burton Act is an act that it's a post-war, essentially a jobs program. And the goal is like, let's figure out how to get all these people back into 
um, into the workforce and get them working and building things, right? It's sort of like a new deal. And what, what, do, let's look around. What do we need? Well, we need more hospitals, right? Hospitals are going to be the future. So we'll get a lot of hospitals. Now, keep in mind that in 1946, even in hospitals, the technology was not great, right? This is before a lot of the really amazing technological explosions. So, you know, paying for a bunch of community hospitals wasn't the most expensive thing you could possibly do because there wasn't a ton of equipment that they needed. It was really just a place for sort of people to go for, uh, you know, really basic surgeries and things. The next step on this landscape is, well, so I'll just say one more thing. <laughs> the Hilburton Act really dramatically increased the the supply of hospitals. And many would say, oversupplied hospitals. And once you create all this really expensive infrastructure, it it's hard to say we shouldn't use it. And so that starts this ball rolling of let's actually sort of um, get, get people into hospitals and get people using hospitals. And then I think the final sort of nail in the coffin of, of sort of overuse of, of, of medical uh, technology is the structure of Medicare itself. And so Medicare in part because of lobbying from physician groups, um, left physicians um, sort of sole practitioners. They were they were sort of con independent contractors, but it left them um, with a fee for service model. So they were paid for every service that they provided, and they were really clear that they wanted that because they didn't want the government to come in and you know prevent them from getting paid or have some sort of quota system or something like that. So the problem then becomes flash forward to twenty twenty or twenty twenty two. Um, whenever you're reading the book, the problem becomes we we compensate a lot for procedures, but we don't compensate for really crucial kinds of or parts of medical care. In particular, we don't compensate for co conversations, communication. We don't compensate for the doctor who sits down and actually tells you that you're dying and actually explains to your family what the what the trajectory of getting the tracheotomy is going to look like right there there nobody gets paid for those conversations and because people don't get trained for them doctors very or because people don't get paid for them doctors very often aren't trained to do them and so one of the problems that um the the comment that you made earlier about sort of how doctors die that's different from the way that that other people die well one big difference is that doctors know what's going on sooner so if you if you get you know if you get diagnosed with stage four lung cancer as a doctor you're pretty sure what's going to happen. Whereas if you get diagnosed with stage four lung cancer as an average person, you're like, I don't know. What does that mean? Is that treatable? Like, what kind of hope is there? Right? How many stages and are there? How many stages are there? Right. So it's not. It's just not clear to the average person like what their prognosis is. Whereas to a doctor, it's much more clear. Like, I'm not getting out of this alive. How am I going to spend my last couple months? And then the final thing I'll mention of that political landscape, which I left out, was as part of this early movement in the in the tens and twenties and thirties, there was a real move to to essentially license other providers out of existence. So the idea was we've standardized our medical training, we've cleaned up our house, we're becoming scientific. Now is the time to get rid of midwives and you know, quack doctors and all these other competitors and really solidify the position of physicians as the as the essentially sole providers. And then nurses come in as sort of their assistants, right? They're 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 always secondary to and always subservient to the physician. And that's the model that we have and have had for now almost a hundred years. So so if you look at if we have high steel tariffs and the steel industry is in favor of high steel tariffs, it's it's not considered, you know, out of line or, or particularly outrageous to suggest that the steel industry might have a selfish interest in keeping out foreign competition or something, something like that. And, and it's not that nobody makes that criticisms of doctors, but it's not it doesn't it's medicine maybe feels more sacred. Doctors couldn't possibly have a base motive like that. But I mean, that you, you, you addressed two, I think, both legitimate rationales for this like licensing out of of you know midwives or nurses out of competing with doctors one is a concern for standardization and and quality you know minimum quality of care and consumer safety and and that's not totally illegitimate though it's i think it's a smaller story than people usually believe but another one is just professional protectionism and i'm wondering what you think of that if if you think that's right and what role like professional organizations like the american medical association specifically played in lobbying efforts to just get their way and reduce supply to raise doctor incomes 
Yeah, they played they played a really huge role. So the the history that we see, you know, if you look at sort of medical history of the of the 20th century, it's a combination of uh, pretty powerful state medical associations and then the growing power of the American Medical Association. And so the American Medical Association and the state medical associations obviously feed feed off each other. And uh, they were all pretty, you know, they, they worked together to um, to limit options, even when they knew that the other providers were providing quality care. So one of the examples I cite in the book is the case of Hannah who's a midwife in Man- in Massachusetts. And she um, she was Massachusetts outlawed midwifery. She got arrested for practicing medicine without a license multiple times. And when she went to trial, some of the evidence that was presented at her trial showed that she had maternal mortality rates that were three times lower than the physicians who testified against her at her trial. And she was still convicted, right? So she's saving women's lives and saving babies' lives and um, and still can't practice, quote unquote, medicine. Did it come up in that trial? I, I, re- I remember reading that and thinking like, what if a, a clever lawyer had that information? I just I'm just picturing the judge like striking the testimony like that's doesn't the relevance of these doctors mortality rate doesn't matter. Stick to the subject. And were you like reading this testimony? Did did that come up much no. later? No, yeah, it came up. It came up later. The other argument that the medical associations often made was a sort of long longitudinal kind of argument, which is, yeah, 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 we're less safe now than midwives. Like we kill <laughs> more mothers and babies all the time. But the reason for that is because we don't have enough women to practice on. And so there's actually this, I cite it in the book, there's a 1912 uh, article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that talks about the midwife problem, quote unquote. And part of the midwife problem is that it leaves physicians without adequate material, quote unquote, to, to practice obstetrics on. They're hogging um, the women. They're hogging all the women's bodies, right? We need those women's bodies uh, in order to practice obstetrics so that we can get better and not kill as many of them. Now, meanwhile, if you are a woman in 1910, you're like, I don't want to be the person who you practice this on. I would much rather be the one who survives thanks to my midwife. And of course, as obstetrics grows as a discipline, people do gain more trust in it. And and so you start seeing cultural forces follow the political forces. And then with, again, the Hill-Burton Act, you you start seeing people be more comfortable with hospitals because you have all these hospitals. So all of these all of these uh, pieces really do uh, sort of um, it creates a kind of cascade effect. So just to be clear, you're not anti medicalization. You're not anti hospital. Um, you're not even anti-hospitalization of some births and some deaths. But my sense from reading the book and talking to you is the emphasis should be on births or deaths that have, well, let's say take births, that have acute high risk factors that, you know, a lot of medical care might have a real good shot at helping the mother and the baby. And very often it's other incentives, misaligned incentives that cause over medicalization and too many procedures like the the doctor's uh, liability incentive is misaligned with the mother's risk incentives when it comes to ordering cesarean sections after or vaginal you know what I'm trying to say and I forget vaginal the acronym after cesarean. that's yeah, the VBAC. one yep yep right I forget exactly what the statistic but it's like it's a, a higher risk for the mother if they're having pr- pregnancies after the cesarean, but it's a higher current risk for the doctor in terms of liability insurance. And I'm, by the way, a cesarean birth for that reason. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I was thinking about yeah. that. Well, and this is another thing that that I think is so interesting about the um, about the the sort of hospital contacts. And I have a whole chapter on liability because I think it's really fascinating. I was expecting I actually a lot of my preconceived notions kind of exploded with this book. And I found myself sort of in this weird position of <laughs> like arguing the opposite of what I thought I was going to be arguing. Um, I honestly walked into the liability chapter thinking like, all right, we're just going to look for why we need tort reform. <laughs> you know, I was like, that that seems logical, right? People are suing people too much. Um, and that's why doctors are, you know, practicing defensive medicine and all this kind of stuff. And then it was just much, much more complicated than than that. And it it really does seem as though um, we have a really high number of medical or a really high percentage of medical errors. So our, our rate of medical errors is very high. Um, malpractice, the the uh, just a tiny, tiny percentage of people who actually are harmed ever sue. 
And many people only sue. And this was the part that I found the most interesting. Many people only sue because that's the only way to get access to the records of what actually happened. So when we talk about Americans being per, like particularly litigious, at least in the medical context, my what I'm finding is that Americans are peculiarly litigious because hospitals circle the wagons when there's a medical error and my patients access to the records that would help them understand what happened. And there's actually some evidence that if a hospital apologizes and offers, you know, follow up treatment or some kind of reparations for the medical error, patients don't sue odd, right? So <laughs> it's not like patients want like $36 million or something like that every time something bad happens. They just sort of want information. And sometimes the only way to get information about what happened is to file a lawsuit so that people are subpoenaed. And then and are the hospitals just worried about that black swan lawsuit where they do lose, yeah. you know, $36 yeah, yep. million? Dollars? Yep. And it only has to happen once. Can you talk about what certificate of need laws are and how those impact mm. the the supply side of medical services or other or non-medical services that might compete with medical services? Yeah, certificate of need laws are weird. Um, so they essentially require, and they're only in operation, I can't even remember how many states, states keep dropping them, but the, the federal government made it a mandate in the 70s that all states had to have what's called a certificate of need or some similar legislation um, in order to keep costs down. And the argument was, if you're going to invest in this really expensive healthcare infrastructure, you need to prove ahead of time that it's really needed because the concern was that with third-party payers, if you decide to open, you know, Chris's hospital and then I decide to open Lauren's hospital, well, now we're competing for a diminished number of patients and we're going to jack up prices to make up for the fact that we don't have access to enough patients, right? And so the third-party payers are looking at this as a potential disaster. So as Medicare grows, right, the, the government says everyone needs to have certificate of need laws. Well, it turns out that the research shows that they don't do anything. They, they well, they actually do some important things, but they're not good things. Well, so and that's not how pricing works. <laughs> it's not, right? <laughs> you, you can't just raise like, prices because there's more competition. That's just not how supply and demand works. A very, very odd understanding of how the of how the medical system works. So the um so the thought is that uh, will require people to sort of demonstrate that there's an actual need in their community and we'll go from there. So it didn't actually lower prices, but what it did do was allow existing providers to do a really, really good job at keeping out competitors. Um, and especially it allowed uh, medical providers to keep out non-medical alternatives. So the the examples that I use in the book, and actually I, I after I published the book, I got some, um, I was asked to come on as a sort of like, I don't know, consultant is too fancy of a word, but like someone who sort of helped out a little bit with um, birth centers in New York State. So birth centers in New York State have to go through this long lengthy certificate certificate of need process. They have to essentially demonstrate that enough interest in their um, uh, in their uh, product or service in this case. Um, and in some states, actually, the hospitals, their direct competitors have veto power. So in Kentucky, for example, no birth center has ever been allowed to open because the hospitals go, we don't need, why would we need more maternity care services? We, we've got it covered. And what, of course, that story doesn't, doesn't fully develop is that, well, you're providing one specific type of maternity care, which is the very highly medicalized maternity care. And maybe other people want a different type of maternity care. But they can't do it in Kentucky. In in New York, you can do it, but it's really, really hard. It's like a two-year process. It's tens of thousands of dollars. Any entrepreneurial midwife, um, I mean, you have to be independently wealthy to get through the certificate of need process. And that's not most entrepreneurs. So it's a real barrier. So what you're describing, uh, existing medical providers, hospitals, being on whatever panels or boards that, that do the approval process for, for a new certificate of need. This is this is just an example of regulatory capture. It sounds like this this phenomenon that it's not a guarantee, but this strong tendency for regulatory boards to become infiltrated or just be made up of industry players themselves. Um, you know, these are these are, and that's not always nefarious. I mean, they're the experts; they know about it. So, who gets tapped to sit on uh, these kind of boards? It's going to be people with experience running hospitals or medical centers. But it shouldn't be surprising that they 
also have an interest in limiting their competition. And this is true on mundane scales too. There's some states that license florists and flower arranging and who sits on the yep. panels to set up the the florist exams. It's other flower arrangers, you know, and it's not as yep. nearly as important, but it's the same thing, it seems to me. Yep. What about well, CPM? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say in New York, it's it's funny. Um, I think they're changing it now, but, but if you looked at the makeup of the Public Health and Health Planning Commission, FIPIC uh, in New York, which is the major planning commission for the state for health, um, there's no midwives, there's uh, no consumer advocates. So it's it's just physicians and professors at research universities and medical universities. Um, and I think there's like one or two um, advanced practice nurses for like just to sprinkle them in there or something. But it's it's heavily physician biased. Yeah. Speaking of universities, uh, how does the accreditation of medical schools fit into this picture? Is that something you looked into much? Because that's another gatekeeping organization, like institutional gatekeeping arm of the medical world. Who gets to be called a medical provider, period? You know, what what do they have to learn to do so? Yeah, I didn't look at it in terms of medical schools particularly, but it does come up in the research that I did on midwives. And so this is actually an interesting sort of um, complexity to the midwifery situation because midwives can be, there, there's multiple paths to midwifery in the United States and in most countries. There, There's a nurse midwife model where you come from a nursing background and then get a midwifery degree, uh, usually through a sort of formal university. And then there's midwifery schools, and there's a that's a sort of combination of coursework and um, sort of apprenticeship. And then there's the more or less traditional midwife path, which is the apprenticeship model. And there's a lot of complexities in terms of licensing. So the, the way that those, you know, sort of who gets to be called a midwife, who gets to practice midwifery. Um, there was an idiotic situation in New York State um, during the pandemic where we had a dearth of out of hospital options for birth and women were terrified to give birth in hospitals. It's a pandemic. <laughs> you don't want to be giving birth in a hospital during this time if you can avoid it. And meanwhile, there's no birth centers, of course, because we have a certificate of need. And then we also licensed all of these certified professional midwives. They're not allowed to practice in New York. And so Cuomo actually opened up the doors to certified professional midwives who are, who are the more informally trained. And that's sort of a pejorative way of describing it. I'm just trying to do it as quickly as I can. But the certified professional midwives, he opened the door for them to come out of state to practice in New York state. At the same time that he was prosecuting certified professional midwives who served Amish communities in New York. <laughs> so it was just this like complete idiocy on the part of our public health uh, policies. Right. Um, and so there, we had a huge maternity desert in upstate New York um, for all the Amish women uh, during the pandemic because the state arrested their midwife it's <laughs> during a pandemic. I mean, it, you cannot make this stuff up. I feel like that's so common. The, the example I always remember is like the federal government's all their efforts to try to reduce smoking while they subsidize tobacco farmers. Exactly. It, it felt very similar. Yeah. What are CPM laws? It's a uh, this this I had heard of certificate of need laws and 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 what is it? Um, corporate practice of medicine. Yeah. And how and what yeah. role do they play? Yeah, those are a little bit trickier. Um, so the corporate practice of medicine laws were originally intended to preserve physician independence. And so the idea was that the only people who own a who should be able to own a practice, um, a med practice, are the physicians themselves. We want to maintain physician autonomy. We want to make sure that physicians aren't um, being sort of bought out by by large corporations. And like with anything in this environment, there's a good angel motive and a bad angel motive sort of operating side Baptists by side. Baptists and bootleggers. Exactly. Yes. The Baptists and the bootleggers. So the Baptists are saying, we want to make sure that doctors can practice autonomously so that they're not recommending low cost solutions just to save a buck for the corporation that they work for, right? We're trying to do the right thing. Well, the bootlegger sort of side of the of the coin is that, well, physicians don't want, they want to maintain their independence because that allows them to set their rates and it allows them to keep salaries, uh, in some cases, artificially high. And so in states that have corporate practice of medicine laws, it actually prevents any corporation, nonprofit or profit, from hiring physicians directly. 
So the positions have to either be like, um, they, like they can't be employed by the corporation. So they have to be like independent contractors or it's like this legal thing. And one of the cases I found that this really messes things up was I was talking to the director of a hospice agency. So this is a nonprofit hospice agency. This isn't like Walmart, right? And the nonprofit hospice agency wasn't allowed to hire a doctor, to, to hire a full-time doctor as their employee. They had to actually contract with the doctor through the insurance company because ironically, there are certain carve-outs in these corporate practice of medicine laws. And those carve-outs are usually insurance companies and hospitals. Those are corporations that can hire physicians directly, but nobody else can. You can see how the monopoly builds up, right? So Denny's can't like hire a staff doctor to be on site or travel between different Denny's locations when a chef cuts off his finger or something. That's illegal. Exactly. Well, in the states that have corporate practice of medicine. Okay. Laws. Yeah. And, and the CPM laws are really hard to track down because they're not all legislation. Sometimes they're administrative rules. Sometimes they're actually court rulings that you have to dig into like administrative law to find. And so I actually thought about doing a little bit more with corporate practice of medicine and then just realized I didn't have the <laughs> bandwidth because it was like, it was just too, it, trying to find it across 50 states, wherever the states put this stuff was really impossible. But think about trying to be a consumer or or trying to be a physician and figuring out what laws apply. I mean, yeah. if I can't figure it out, I have a PhD in political science. I don't know how the average person figures this And I'm out. guessing calling them CPM laws is a researcher's shorthand. I'm guessing not every CPM law comes conveniently labeled and searchable as a corporate practice of medicine law. Nope. Yeah, it's you're not called... going to be able to Google at something it's else. It's like <laughs> assistant executive order 17.893. Yeah. That's easy to find. And the other one you already mentioned, another big element that funnels these kinds of things into a medical model is funding and the way reimbursement works. Is that primarily Medicare? Or there, there's also just the rules that private insurance companies have. And some of that is probably most of it is influenced by regulatory rules as well. Yeah. So one of the frustrating things for a lot of the midwives that I talk to is that licensure is linked to Medicare reimbursement and Medicaid in the case of um, in the case of birth. So almost 50 percent of women, it's like above 45 percent, um, get Medicaid during uh, pregnancy because they, they increase the income level for pregnant women to ensure that people have access to prenatal care. So it, it affects a huge number of, of pregnant and birthing people. And the problem is that if you're not licensed, even if you're a really good midwife, and even if you're licensed in another state, if you are not licensed in the state that you're practicing in, um, obviously you you can be prosecuted in many states, but you also can't bill insurance for your services. You can't bill Medicaid and often private insurance. And so what ends up happening is a lot of home birth midwives just issue insurance altogether and say, I'll just do one global fee. You know, usually it's it's around $4,000 for the whole entire birth. Others do sort of interesting middle ground where like they can, like sometimes they can bill insurance for the prenatal care, but then the delivery has to be out of pocket. I mean, it's just, they have to do all of these sort of machinations just to figure out a way to get paid, even if their provider, or I'm sorry, even if the client has insurance. And so a lot of that's because we link, you know, and, and you can see the state's interest here, right? They don't want to provide a lot of payments to unlicensed providers. You know, you don't want to have Medicare reimbursing the woman who sells crystals on the corner. But we have a lot of people who are licensed in different states in different complicated ways. And, and when Medicaid reimbursement is limited to licensure status, it causes a lot of problems of access. Is there any move to... I forget what you call it, like regulatory parity laws. Is there any move towards something along those lines where you could list a number of relevant peer countries or states and say, you know, any any medical provider licensed and recognized in any OECD country or US or Canadian state or something like that is good? I um, mean, that seems like a, a low bar that shouldn't be too controversial. Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's very controversial just because of the status of Physician midwife antagonism in the United States is is much more dramatic than it is in other countries. Obamacare did move us in that direction. They the the Affordable Care Act required that nurse midwives, so certified nurse midwives, which is a specific licensure status, that they be reimbursable by Medicaid anywhere that they practice in the United States. 
The problem with that is that most certified nurse midwives practice in hospitals. So you're actually not opening it up to to birth centers. You, you're not opening it up to... Um, uh, now, a lot of birth centers have nurse midwives on their practice, but the majority of people who do out of hospital birth are usually certified professional midwives. And they are only reimbursable I don't know if I have the most accurate up-to-date data, but I, I think they're reimbursable in Oregon and there, there may be one or two other states. And the issue is that Medicaid is, it's a joint, it's its not simply the federal government that decides where Medicaid dollars are going, right? It's a its a joint program between the medical, the federal government and the state governments. And so the state governments get to decide who gets reimbursed, which means that it becomes a political football. And so if you look at the states that um, that support midwifery, reimbursement. Um, they tend to be more progressive. They tend to have a stronger history of sort of openness to alternative practitioners, whereas the the sort of predictable states, um, like, for example, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, right, those states are certainly not going to use Medicaid dollars to reimburse midwives. This has come up peripherally in the conversation a lot, well, directly, but um, maybe we could say something more directly about it. There's the critical element of the book where you're criticizing the over-medicalization and over-treatment and, and laying out some of the causes. But you you also talk a lot about alternatives, and I want to make sure people don't come away with the impression that the alternatives you're primarily focusing on, these aren't crystals, for instance. You know, you're talking about very <laughs> common and well-supported things like Talk about what exactly is a birth center and how does it differ from a hospital birth? It's not giving birth with crystals. And also palliative care and hospice in the case of dying. Can you say something about those? Yeah, great question. So birth centers are are really misunderstood and I, I don't know why. Um, we actually, I, I originally wanted to give birth in a birth center and this was actually the reason that I started writing the book was I I I live in New York I figure we have every kind of everything right like why not have a birth center, um, and then I realized that I the there were only two birth centers in the entire state and I couldn't figure out why that would be the case given how many people I knew that did home birth and I was like why don't we have this middle ground, and it turned out that it was certificate of need so I was like oh okay that's why <laughs> we don't, um, but. The a birth center is, I think, a, a nice middle ground between a home birth and um, and a hospital birth. And I, I've known a bunch of people who have who have had wonderful home births as well. Um, I wasn't super comfortable with it as as a first time mom, but a birth center is essentially a um, a small outpatient. It's usually a home or a, a sort of comfortable building, and there's beds and bedrooms, and there is medical equipment. So one one misconception that people have about both midwifery and birth centers is that if something happens, like I, I always hear this argument, like what happens if, if there's, you know, if someone starts bleeding out or like what happens if there's an emergency? And so I think people sort of assume that there's no medical knowledge at all, which is just not the case. So birth centers and midwives carry, they carry medication to help stop bleeding. They can usually stabilize patients in the vast, vast majority of cases. They stabilize patients who do have an emergency until they can get to a hospital. And the other crucial thing that both birth centers and midwives do is that they're very careful with the patients that they select, right? It's a triage system. So you choose low risk women who have a very high chance of giving birth vaginally because you don't want to have people go through the difficulty of, of transferring to a hospital. Birth centers have a lot of safety measures in place. Again, they have medications, they have uh, a certain degree of medical equipment, but the big difference is that the medical equipment is not front and center, which makes it easier to give birth vaginally if that's what you want to do. And a lot of people have pointed out that birth centers have a much higher rate of vaginal birth than hospitals. And part of that is because if the medical tools are there, you're going to use them and you're going to use them at a much higher rate than you probably need to. And I don't think that's a controversial statement. I think most of the physicians that I that I interviewed and the data that we have demonstrates the fact that the, the biggest predictor of whether you get a C-section or not in the United States is not actually your risk factor as an individual. It's the hospital you give birth in. So if you give birth at a, at a hospital with a high C-section rate, that increases your C-section rate. It has nothing to do with you as an individual. So similarly, if you give birth at a birth center that 
can't give surgical births, right? You have a lower chance of having a C-section simply because people aren't incentivized to use those tools. So yeah, birth centers have a lot of different options for pain relief. They have a lot of options for handling emergencies and they're trained. They have protocols for transfers. So they know how to communicate with local hospitals. They know how to communicate with, for example, ambulances. The vast majority of transfers from birth centers are not emergencies. Most people who transfer from birth centers just want more pain medication than birth centers can offer. That's the reason most people transfer. So it's not even the case that you have like tons and tons of birth center patients flooding hospitals with like hemorrhages or something. You know, the vast majority of people show up because they want an epidural or something. Yeah, it's gotten too intense and they want an epidural. Right. So that's another that's like a big misconception about both home birth and um, and that's true for home birth too. most transfers from home births are not emergent transfers. They're people who just want more pain meds than they can get at home. And that's totally fine. That's sort of the background on birth centers. I can follow up with any questions that you might have. Palliative care and hospice, I think, are also really misunderstood, but um, really fantastic resources in in terms of, I like to talk about sort of pluralizing healthcare, right? Providing more options for people who have diverse and sort of even idiosyncratic interests or needs. Um, Palliative care and hospice are often used Uh, synonymously, but they're very different. So palliative care is actually a, it's a medical specialty and palliative care physicians uh, go through a residency like other specialists and they're trained in symptom management. So instead of just giving people chemo, palliative care physicians are also trained in, let's figure out how to handle nausea. Let's figure out maybe complementary medications that we can give to deal with anxiety that comes from being terminally ill. Let's talk about getting you hooked up with a social worker who can help your family figure out some final plans, right? All of those kinds of things that are often left out of of the care of terminal patients. Um, Hospice is a little bit different because it started as, I think, a really beautiful movement to help people who are dying, who medicine could not do anything more for. And now it's actually a federally regulated term. So you you can only call yourself a hospice if you receive in the United States, if you receive the Medicare hospice benefit, which means that you you meet all of these federal requirements for what you do and how you do it. And so you have these hospice agencies and they provide a, a hospice care. And the hospice care is end of life care. It's strictly regulated to people who have less than six months left to live. And you have to forego curative treatment. And this is a really big problem because for a lot of people, they want the benefits that hospice care can provide, which is, you know, the support for their families or the pain medication or the palliative, uh, the symptom management, but they don't necessarily want to give up chemo altogether. And so the, the Medicare hospice benefit is actually really poorly structured because it forces people to choose between curative treatment and hospice care, which means that fewer people choose hospice care, right? Like you feel like you're sort of forced into it if you do. Um, the advantage of palliative care for hospitals that have palliative care physicians and practitioners, uh, my sister is a palliative care nurse practitioner. The benefit of palliative care is that you can continue to get curative treatment while you receive palliative care. So you can get chemo and have a palliative care physician who's helping you manage symptoms, who's helping you deal with um, the, you know, any end of life stuff, who's hooking your family up with the social workers, you know, all of the sort of holistic stuff. So, um, and palliative care physicians are also really, really important for helping families understand how to de-escalate care at the end of life. So if you think that you're going to survive, you might, you might add treatment and add treatment and add treatment. And all of a sudden you've got all of these really complicated things going on and palliative care physicians can come in and say, let's, let's back off some of these medications or let's try to move to a different kind of machine or whatever. I'm obviously not a doctor, but the idea is that they're, they're the ones who are sort of trained in avoiding escalation in the first place and de-escalating when they can. Do they have very clear guidelines on what counts as you said they have to forego curative treatment? Like what counts as curative treatment? For hospice, they 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 have to you have to forego curative treatment. Yeah. Um, and it's a little unclear. So um, there's well, it's not that unclear. There's pretty clear guidelines on what constitutes curative. There are some like so you can you can get palliative radiation, for example, which is radiation that will not it won't cure you. It's not going to make the tumor smaller. It's not going to help you live longer. Um, but it might 
uh, it sort of reduces the, the the size of the tumor to reduce pain, right? Or, or it specifically targets a specific part of the body to reduce pain. So that would be considered, that would be consistent with hospice because it's not, it's not going to cure you. It's not going to make you better, but it will at least help deal with the symptoms until you die. So there's certain kinds of um, certain things that would be curative in one context are considered palliative in other contexts. And it really just depends on, um, but in order to essentially, in order to, to be um, admitted to hospice, you have to have a doctor who says this patient has less than six months to live and is foregoing curative treatment. Here are the treatments that we're providing and they are not curative for X, Y, and Z reason. And this is actually a big barrier to hospice care because a lot of people enter hospice during the last couple of days of their lives. And for for you to go through this like intensive onboarding process when all you want to do is get out of the damn hospital and go to a hospice and be with your family, but you've got to find someone who's on call. You've got to find someone who's capable of doing, who, who's regulate from the regulatory perspective is capable of doing this um, this assessment. It means that a lot of people end up dying in hospitals who should be dying at home with their families because they literally can't get into a hospice in time. And so that's actually a, a pretty sad situation. So they need to be, a doctor needs to say they have less than six months to live, but you said most of the time they're really just going in with a few days. Yeah. And that's another, so another problem with the way that the hospice benefit is structured is um, it was really created at the time that the Medicare hospice benefit was created at a time when you had primarily cancer and AIDS patients. And it was fairly easy. I mean, I'm using easy in sort of the broad sense, but it was easier to determine when people were likely to die. Now, though, more people are dying of other kinds of things, chronic illnesses, diabetes, or for, you know, kidney disease, um, or dementia. And dementia is the real difficult one, because most people with dementia, you can't do anything for them. They shouldn't be hospitalized. And yet they're not they don't have less six, than six months to live. And so or you not, just don't have any good way of knowing if they you have no way of knowing. Yeah. So the problem becomes more and more people don't qualify for hospice until they're really acutely ill. And that's, uh, and then it's really hard to find them placement because and they then may at be that really point happy. they have foregone months or maybe years of comfort that they could have yeah. had in yeah. that kind of circumstance. Yeah. I spoke with uh, historian David Beto mm -hmm. on this show a little bit ago, and he's written a lot about mutual aid societies and the history of mutual aid societies and the medical elements that those brought to working class people. And, and you br bring it up in your book a little bit as well. Are things like um, corporate practice of medicine laws like the main impediment to contemporary mutual aid and fraternal societies uh, hiring their own doctors? Or are there other impediments yeah, to that I, as far as you know? There, So there's other impediments to that. Um, and I actually, I, I, I wanted to reach out to David um, last year about the mutual aid stuff because I've been, I've been interested in sort of digging into that a little bit more. One really interesting example from the Rochester area, I don't know why we have this. No other place in the nation has this as far as I can tell, but we have a really large number of what are called homes for the dying. Um, sometimes they're called comfort care homes when people are uncomfortable with the word dying, but um, they're essentially hospices that, um, now you can't use that word to describe them, but they're essentially places that people can go to receive hospice care that's not their home. And the reason that that's important is that another really big problem with the Medicare hospice benefit is that it limits the active care that most people can get to something like four hours a day. Um, so a nurse will come and, you know, help you out with meds and stuff, but then they leave. And if you live alone or your spouse works or, you know, you have serious mobility issues and you don't have anyone home full time to take care of you, most people, a lot of people die in hospitals because they just don't have enough people at home to take care of them because the hospice benefit leaves this huge gap. So the homes for the dying are fascinating because they're, they're the definition of mutual aid. They're um, homes that are usually purchased um, by a nonprofit, often funded by churches. Like the ones that I interviewed were, were church funded, but sometimes they're funded by just sort of philanthropic organizations in the city or something like that. And they'll accept any, usually they accept people who have less than three months to live, um, but there's no payment. And so essentially what the house does, the who run the house, is they bill um, 
they essentially have a hospice agency that comes in and the hospice agency handles the care and then the hospice agency bills Medicare, but the patient doesn't provide any kind of payment. And it also provides an opportunity for families. Usually these houses have bedrooms where families can sleep so you can stay close to the person. They're just really, it's like, it's like a really beautiful model. Um, But one of the limitations to the spread of this model, as I was talking to one of the executive directors and she said, yeah, well, we have to stay um, two beds or smaller. So all of these, all of these um, homes for the dying only have two options. They have two beds for dying people and that's it. And the reason, of course, that they do that is that at least under New York regulations, anything above two beds counts as either a nursing home or a hospital and the regulations apply. And so you're regulating this really beautiful model essentially out of it, or you're preventing it from scaling up um, with these idiotic regulations. Because once you're regulated like a nursing home or a hospital, well, all bets are off, right? You can't afford with philanthropic dollars. And without that, a lot of bets are still off because then you're having to buy a house for every two beds you want to provide. Exactly. Yeah. It's a whole house for every two beds. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, but we still have 20 or more of these places. So if, if people are looking for a place to die peacefully, I guess um, the Finger Lakes area of New York is a, is a good place to go. I, I have no idea why that's the case, but um, <laughs> but that's a fascinating sort of, it's not exactly mutual aid, but it's kind of in that arena, you know, of, of people just trying to help out people at the end of life. And then coming up against all these idiotic regulatory barriers to doing so. Um, But they still managed to do it, which is inspiring. That's cool. So your book is mostly about America, but I don't have you looked into other contemporary countries that might have either never gone down this path or have 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 medical regimes that that uh, are significantly better in these particular ways. Obviously, there's a lot of diversity in ways that probably don't bear as directly on your thesis. But in these particular ways, what other countries are models or partial models for reform? Yeah, um, I would say both Canada and the UK, at least in terms of the triage system that they use for for labor and delivery. Denmark, I think, does this too. So essentially, you give birth with a midwife unless a medical issue results that requires a surgeon, right? Like that seems like a very commonsensical way to do things. But in the US, you start with a surgeon. Whereas in the UK or Canada, you start with a midwife and then a surgeon comes in if a surgeon is necessary. And so that's how they sort of do things. And they have better outcomes across the board. One interesting wrinkle to this, though, I don't want to pretend that it's all sort of like rainbows, because one interesting problem that you have in the NHS, which is the UK um, system, the National Health Service, is that there's actually been a lot of criticisms of midwives in National Health Service hospitals, criticisms that the midwives ration care, that they prevent mothers from accessing adequate pain medication. And so the criticism, the the more common criticism that I see in the UK is actually under treatment. So um, there's a kind of middle ground that we want to hit, right? It's not about sort of like releasing everybody to give birth in like the nearest cornfield, right? Like without any kind of medical care at all. <laughs> sounds some beautiful. Kind of, <laughs> it sounds great. There's some kind of middle ground that we need to to try to address. And the other thing that I, I try to focus on this in the book is, you know, people are individuals, right? So some some women want an unmedicated birth. Others would would rather die, right? Like it like it sucks. So the idea that there's one type of birth, and that's partly why I think it's so important to support a pluralistic view of, of what kinds of healthcare providers we want to have around, is because people have different preferences. I, I know that sounds crazy, but like people do. People want to die in different ways. Um, some people want to go full throttle every medical intervention they can possibly get until the very end. Other people say stage four cancer, get me out of here, right? I want to go home and spend time on my sailboat and kiss my wife and then die, right? And so people should be able to have their preferences met by a diversity of providers with all sorts of different kinds of training that that all are, you know, there's a minimum quality of training that you want. But the idea that we need one type of healthcare provider for for people who are dying or people who are giving birth, I think is really problematic. And that's part of the the problem that we're facing is people make that assumption. You really emphasize in the book how unlike many other aspects of care and medicine, giving birth and dying are incredibly preference sensitive and incredibly diverse in how we, you know, you, you don't get yes. the same diversity and intensity of 
of belief and feeling about how you want to give birth or how you want to die. You know, if I go in to get an appendectomy, I'm probably you're probably not going to hear like a speech about what my religion has to say about it. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but uh, everyone's got strong feelings about how they want to die or give birth. Exactly. Yeah. And and those and the other important thing is that those feelings have really important impacts on the outcomes. So I think people underestimate this, right? There's a sort of idea that you can like traumatize women during labor and delivery and it won't affect the outcome. That's actually not how the human body works, right? <laughs> when you when you dramatically increase anxiety and fear, it turns out that the body tenses up and it turns out that muscles and uh, and a variety of other things, including, say, the cervix, don't work as well. So, of course, you're going to have higher rates of C-section in situations where women are really anxious and terrified. Um, and that's true no matter what context you're in. But I think the same thing is true at death, right? They've done lots of research on the effect of anxiety on pain. So if you're fearful of your family's future or if your doctor's not communicating with you, that can ratchet up pain at the end of life. And and so we need to pay more attention to the fact it's not just about meeting people's preferences. It's the way in which people's preferences matter for the actual medical outcomes that we claim to be caring about. And And that's where I think we're missing the boat. Yeah. A person's ability to manage and deal with pain is so much better if they are not horribly anxious or scared or sad yeah like you, you yeah. can a person can handle a lot of a lot of pain if their mindset is right <laughs> i mean the and exactly. even just how you interpret how you interpret what your body is feeling is mediated a lot by what you believe is happening in your mindset i'll steal an example from sam harris that if after a really intense workout you feel you feel kind of good and and you're exhausted and your body may be sore But if for some reason you woke up in the middle of the night with the same physical symptoms of having just worked out really hard, you'd be horrified. Uh, And it would probably like what I am literally dying. (laughs) Yeah, you'd interpret it in all the wrong ways. And that would really affect the way it feels. So there's uh, actually a beautiful study on um, just really quickly on that point. There's a beautiful study on Dutch women that that looks at their experience during labor and delivery. um, And they actually report less pain. And people people don't think it's because like Dutch women have some genetic capacity to handle pain. It's that culturally it's understood as a different kind of experience. And that cultural understanding mediates their pain experience. It's actually just like, that's how humans work. Surprise. Anyway, Yeah. That doesn't <laughs> seem surprising that, that that would affect these kinds of things would affect the way you, uh, you recall or experience something like that. I, I was wondering, obviously it would be a much bigger book might've taken you a few decades to write, but do the things you point to about birth and death? I mean, Robin Hanson has made a a, a hobby of uh, trying to popularize a handful of big longitudinal studies that seem to show that a whole lot of medical care just doesn't actually um, have any strong influence on health. Not all, but a lot of it. A lot of it does, and there are a lot of big longitudinal studies about giving people large amounts of essentially free health care for like five or 10 years and checking back later. And there's just they're just not healthier than than a control group who didn't get that. And even if that's not true of every kind of medical care, does does this thesis, do you think, apply more broadly than just birth and death? Absolutely. Um, I think it applies to almost any medical condition um, for which there's a strong sort of um, social component or that's that's preference sensitive. Um, I mean, even, you know, the research on on diabetes, I think, is fascinating. There's there's just so many things in which there's there's much more to the picture than the medical picture. And and this is a criticism, I think, that, that sociologists have have done a nice and medical anthropologists have done a nice job of, of demonstrating, which is that you know, it's it's not the case that, um, and I was actually really critical of that sort of view maybe ten years ago, um, until I experienced it myself. But but the idea that 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 science is object that medicine is objective, um, at its best it is right. But we know we we act, I mean, there's been a ton of different sort of crises in terms of replication, but also really serious problems with falsification of data. That's an issue. Um, but it's also just true that there, you know, we can't control all the variables that affect health. And and so medical care is just one of those variables. And we need to start thinking more about the kind of medical care that we offer and the way that we sort of treat the um, 
the person in front of us as opposed to reducing them to a set of organs or something like that, which is, I, I think that's how doctors are trained and, and understandably so, but you've got to zoom back out at some point. Yeah. And under certain contexts with very acute and serious issues, you might prefer that. I mean, I don't know that I would really want a surgeon taking out my kidney, staring at me and picturing the whole me, you know, and what is this guy yes. really about? What are his values? I yes. want him to focus on my kidney or liver or whatever and, and treat me like a machine that he understands very well. One aspect of exactly. But uh, yep. in a lot of cases, that would feel dehumanizing and pro and probably wouldn't improve my health outcomes. Right. Um, are you working on any ongoing uh, or new projects right now? I am. I'm actually in the early stages of um, a third book, uh, but it's right now it's an article form, which actually extends a lot of these themes that I found um, in the book. Uh, so it's it's sort of looking at the role that regulations play. It, it's essentially looking at sort of unintended consequences of um, of regulations, but from I'm looking at it from the perspective of a kind of moral questioning of what precisely we're doing. So the overall argument that I hear from a lot of people is that regulations exist to prevent us from doing things that harm us. And what I want to look at are cases where regulations really seem to prevent us from doing things that would be good for ourselves and other people. And so the the case of birth centers is one of the sort of case studies that I'm that I'm looking at, but there's uh there's lots of other ones, you know, sort of essentially crowding out innovation and and really important kinds of options for people to make choice worthy contributions to the world. I had started by actually looking at it from a bioethics lens because one of the things that that interested me in the book itself that this uh, the medicalization book was that the way that we structure medical care actually undermines a lot of the bioethical principles that medicine claims to protect. So I thought yeah. that was kind of interesting and obviously deeply troubling. But then once I started looking even outside medicine, I noticed that the same thing is really true, that very often we have these regulations that are aiming at one, one particular sort of good, quote unquote, and in fact are undermining the very ethical obligations that we have to our citizens. Um, it's particularly true in the professions, but I actually think it, it applies across the board as well, um, that I think overregulation, however you sort of want to define that, can actually make it harder to be a moral person. And what was the name of the book you wrote before before this one, The Medicalization of Birth and Death? My first book was Family and the Politics of Moderation, and that's with Baylor University Press. I'm going to include those as well as where people can find you in any particular way yeah. people ought to keep up with you if they're interested in your work. I wish I could say that I update my website the way that I probably should, but probably <laughs> the easiest way for them to find me is um, just on my institutional um, webpage. I keep my publications up to date there. So they can find me by uh, searching for me on rit.edu. I'll link to those. What is a book or author you might recommend that would complement this work particularly well? There's two. Um, so I mentioned the Paul Starr book, which I, I really like. Um, the other one that I found really wonderful was a book by Sharon Kaufman, who is one of the um, pioneers in medical anthropology. And uh, she has two books, A Time to Die. And now I'm blanking on what the second one is, but I can find it for you. Uh, she actually just passed away this year, um, which is uh, unfortunate. But, um, but A Time to Die, she actually sort of embedded herself within... Um, hospitals and just sort of watched how people made decisions about how to die. But then she places it back into the context of Medicare, the structure of Medicare and this broader sort of policy context. It's beautifully written. It's really intricate. Um, and she just does a, a really great job at um, sort of detailing how complex the, the incentive structure is and how difficult it is for people to get out. And then the last one I'll mention for people who are interested in birth is a book uh, called Cut It Out <laughs> about the C-section epidemic. Horrible. But she has, um, yeah, it's it's a great title. And that uh, she has a wonderful chapter on liability. So she actually sort of undermines the, um, the modern myth that doctors are just practicing defensive medicine because people won't stop suing them. So that's another really good book to read. I'll include those as well. My Thanks. guest today has been political scientist Lauren Hall. Her book is The Medicalization of Birth and Death. Lauren, thank you for joining me on Ideas Having Sex. Thanks. 
Thank you. This was really fun. Thank you for listening to Ideas Having Sex, where we have stimulating conversations on social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you're a fan of what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening. Thank you.